good to be with you today. I want to welcome everybody across all of our locations and those of you joining us online. Happy New Year. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and uh, find Genesis chapter one as uh, we get ready to kind of kick off a new series for a new year. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you find yourself coming into 2024. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I don't know if you're feeling somewhat optimistic and hopeful about the 12 months ahead of us, or maybe you're a little bit, you know, kind of cautious about what may be around the corner. I, I would say that, uh, you know, regardless of either one of those perspectives, like, uh, both of those are probably legitimate. You know, just enough, I've had enough experience and enough, you know, just know what's happened kind of throughout history to know that just in the next uh, 12 months or so, uh, there's probably some things to be hopeful for. There's some things to be a little cautious about. I, 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 I wish we could predict what 2024 has got in store for us, but there's no way of fully uh, knowing that, uh, we, we certainly do our best, though, to try to figure that out. I, it seems like the first couple of days right after uh, New Year's, I'll um, read as many different articles, listen to podcasts as I can that'll forecast, you know, where we're headed. I don't know if any of you do that. I, I was listening to a podcast this last week, and um, the whole thing was um, 2024 trends, the trends that are coming towards us in this next year, and they, they lit, had, had maybe half a dozen or so of them, but out of all of them, maybe the most memorable was, um, this was just their opinion, they said that um, they really feel like the years 2015 to 2023 uh, was what we might call the age of anxiety. Would you agree with that? I, I think I'd probably agree with that. Kind of seems like, especially over the last several years, like I could probably preach on that subject monthly, and I don't think anybody would object because, uh, you know, it's so pervasive in our worlds, our society. And, but they, so they kind of were saying, they, this is some good news. They, they really feel like 2023 was um, the ending of that age. Now, not that anxiety is going to go away, but they were just saying the age of anxiety kind of bracketed around 2015, 2023. And then 2024, we're entering into a new age. And I thought, oh, this is good. Good. Like, like what could it be? You know, the age of good times? You know, the age of wondrous joy? You know, that's, that's what I was kind of hoping for. But uh, no, actually, they, they said they, they really feel like the natural next, next step progression is 2024 through the next set of years is the age of anger. Oh, goody. <laughs> Your response was exactly mine. Right? And I'm uh, just like, oh, great. You know, here we go. And, and they talk, this is just their perspective. They talk about a number of things. We're already seeing evidences of it. And that's actually the natural progression to go from anxiety to anger. They did have a silver lining in it, but you'll have to listen to the podcast. But um, so I'm like, you know, I'm uh, hearing all this and, and uh, you know, I, we don't know. We don't know. We, we don't know what the future is going to hold in the year ahead. I, I think that I can speak pretty confidently, though, to the fact that um, the next 12 months are going to be filled with um, good times and bad. Would you agree? Mount, mountaintops and valleys, um, setbacks and breakthroughs, a uh, fair amount of blessing and a fair amount of pain. So I don't really know how much good it does us to try to anticipate the future as much as it is, as much as it is, to become a people, to be a person and a people who is ready for whatever may come. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk speaks to this in chapter three, verse 19. I love this verse. It says the... Um, the sovereign Lord, now that word sovereign just simply means that God does know, like God is in control, he's the only one who does, and uh, he, he um, is never caught off guard, that's a good way to put it, like God never watches the news and thinks to himself, oh myself, I did not think that was ever going to happen, like he's not, he's not frantically panicking over things, like he's like, yep, that's about the way that I ordained it. To happen, watch me work. Like that's what that word sovereign means. The sovereign Lord is my, say the word out loud with me. The other two services were miserable at this. So you guys just say the word out loud. Strength, strength. there you go. You, you guys did the best job at that. The sovereign Lord is my strength. Not my circumstances, not my ability to predict the future, not my, my, my bank account, not the way my relationships are going. The, the sovereign Lord is my source of strength. And he says something kind of strange. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I ever prayed that prayer. God, could you just make my feet like the feet of a deer, you know? But, but I'll, I'll explain what he means by that in just a minute. It's actually pretty brilliant. He goes, he enables me to tread on the heights. So that, that, that desire of like, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer is kind of like this. It's this like mountain animal, maybe like a, a mountain goat that is like 
uh, skinny legs, but strong ones. Like you just kind of look at that ground, that looks pretty intimidating, but they're able to scale the heights because of the strength of their feet. And I don't know about you, but most of the time when I um, pray, and uh, by the way, I'm kind of ashamed to admit this out loud, but it seems like my prayer life ramps up when life gets really hard. Anybody, anybody with me in that? Yeah, yeah, you don't want to admit that. That's true. And uh, you know, when times are good, I forget to talk to God. Times are bad, that's when I talk to him. And so uh, most of the time though, my, my prayers, here, here's, here's what I end up praying most of the time. God, could you please flatten the ground under my feet? And maybe what he wants to do is he wants to strengthen your feet for unstable ground. That's a different kind of a prayer. God, could you please remove me from these painful circumstances? You know, beam me up, Scotty, like Star Trek style. Just get me out of here. And God's like, no, actually, I'd like to, to keep you in it. I'm sovereign, I'm in control. And uh, I'm gonna keep you in that to, to develop some things within you, some character that couldn't be developed any other way. See, most of the time, I want God to change my circumstances. And, and it's not that he won't. It's not that he can't. It's not that, I'm not telling you not to pray for that. But it's just that I think he's more interested in the development of our character. So regardless of what 2024 throws at you or us, I think one of the things that uh, we can do is we can be ready. And the way to be ready is to understand who you are, your identity, and there, then from that, why am I here? Um, I don't know if any of you remember seeing that movie, Chariots of Fire, from a long time ago, but uh, Eric Liddell was, was training for the 1924 Olympics, and his sister Jenny thought that was a waste of time. She was like, you know, I, she really thought that the purpose of his life was to be a missionary, and uh, Eric turns to her and he says this infamous line, Jenny, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. And there it is right there. So when, so when we're talking about God's will, God's plan, God's purpose for your life, generally and specifically, that's what I'm talking about. And, and this is the question. I don't know when the last time you thought about this was, because you know, life is coming at all of us so fast. So many decisions, you know, we're trying to make ends meet, trying to survive, just trying to keep everything on the rails. But when was the last time that you stopped and you're like, when is it that I feel the pleasure of God? What I mean is like, when is the last time that I'm like, man, this, I was made to do this. Like, I feel like I'm right in the center of his will. And how do you even begin to, to figure that out? And that's what this series is about. So we jump into a new year. Uh, part of the prompting of this series came actually last Easter. Last Easter, I surveyed the whole church. I just said, hey, if there's any sermon topic, if there's any message series that could help you in your spiritual growth, what, wherever you're at, take your next step. And the number one answer by far from all of you was how do I discover God's will and purpose for my life? And um, that is such a great topic. I think Mark Twain said it this way. He said, the two most important days of your life are the day that you were born and the day that you figure out why. And all of us are trying to figure this out and uh, it doesn't really matter what stage of life you're in. I think the question is just as pertinent for all of us. And I think that we, we feel like, um, well, you know, if I, if I knew what it was that God specifically wanted me to do, then it would help me answer some of the questions that we all face. So maybe you're in a season of your life right now. Uh, high school seniors, you know, you're trying to figure out like, um, uh, where should I go to college? Should I go to college? What uh, major should I, you know, uh, declare? Um, maybe you're in a season of your life right now, maybe in midlife where you're like, man, you know, should I, should I switch careers? Um, or, you know, should I start this relationship or end that relationship? Or what, what pursuit should I go after? Maybe you're in a season of life or maybe you're kind of wrestling, grappling with some regrets and maybe wondering if you let some things um, go that maybe you should have addressed a long time ago. It really doesn't matter what stage of life we're all in. I think all of us are filled with all kinds of questions and we're wanting to know, God, what is your will for my life? And we sort of treat it like, like, that, like I just want to kind of go ahead and establish your expectations for this message. I'm not going to tell you what your will, what God's will is for your life. I'm gonna give you something kind of generally that I think you can go off of, but I think oftentimes that's what we want. We want God to send us an email. The will, my will for your life is blank. You know, it's like, thanks for clarifying, now I'm gonna go do that. Or, or maybe we treat it this way. It's kind of like uh, trying to crack the code on a safe. And so it's like about, you know, a couple turns to the right here, meet this person, a couple turns to the left, take that job, you know, a couple turns to the right, set this financial goal, click. 
open up the safe, that's God's will and purpose for my life. I don't, I don't think it really works that way. I wish it would, but I don't think that's how God's will for our lives work. I, I, I do know this. I think we have to start here, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, this is read at almost every you know, high school graduate um, you know, receives this verse in some fashion. It says, uh, God, has, God desires to, for you to have a hope and a future. And I just want you to know that, that the God's not trying to withhold his will for your life. God's not trying to, do, it's not like this cat and mouse game, this guessing game where you gotta figure it out. God wants you to have a hope and he wants you to have a future. It's just that I think that much of the time, what we want is uh, for, we're mostly when we're asking that question, we're, we're looking at external circumstances when God is looking internally at our character. And I sometimes wonder this, um, that if God were to suddenly thrust you into his will for your life, like that thing that gives him pleasure and you fulfillment, that thing that you were put uniquely on this planet to do, uh, for most of us, our character wouldn't be ready for it. And our character has to be developed to handle our gifting and the opportunities that are in front of us. And that just simply takes time. And unfortunately, it takes some pain and it takes some waiting, regardless of how old you, you might be. See, see you, you can't control circumstances, which I think, I think most of us know that. But what we can do, regardless of the circumstances that you're in, is you can cultivate character. And when you look at the scriptures, you just see that every person that God used in a significant way Circumstances were just outside of their control. All of them walked through a season of pain, and yet in the midst of that, they, they could cultivate their character, and then you just begin to get this sense that that's really what God's after all along. And so the greatest barrier between you and the future that you want is uh, inside of you, not outside of you. The only person who can take you out of the will of God is you, not anyone or anything else, not any set of circumstances. God will sustain you through the valleys and as well as the mountaintops. So when discovering God's purpose and will for my life, where do we even begin? So I hope you're jotting down a few notes, uh, not for my sake, but, but for yours, just to spend a little bit of time kind of chewing on this, marinating on it through the week. But here's the first thing to write down. This is so elementary. But if you are going to discover God's will for your life, you've got to start with God. Not, not you, not, not like, hey, what, God, what is it that you want me to do? You gotta start with him. In other words, um, creator. So uh, Ephesians uh, 1, 11 through 12 puts it this way. I love how the message paraphrases it. It says, it is in Christ that we find out who we are. That's like so specific. And what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and every one. Colossians 1 says it this way. We look at this son and see God's original purpose in everything he created. For everything, absolutely everything, got started in him and finds its purpose in him. So uh, here's another way of saying what we just read. You were made by God and for God. And until you really fully understand that, then you will never fully know or re grab onto God's will and purpose for your life. It, it won't make any sense. Now, just from my pastoral observation, most of the time when people come to me and they say, hey, how do I, how do I discover God's will for my life? Um, I'm always, I always will ask this uh, follow-up question. Well, which one? And you're like, well, you mean there's more than one? And I'm like, yeah, there, there's more than one. So most of the time when we're asking for God's will and purpose for my life, we, we, we overlook something that's really important. And it, it would be simply this. Uh, there's what we might call God's general will for our lives. If we could throw up that definition. God's general will for our lives. And uh, if I could sum that up, it would be like uh, the Ten Commandments and the Great Commandment. So the Ten Commandments in the New Testament, actually there's way more than, than ten laws, by the way. There's like a whole bunch of them. But that's like God's top ten. And the top 10 is not your way to make it into heaven. The top 10 is basically, here's how I like to think about it, is that if every single person all across the world could live by the 10 commandments, we would eliminate pain and hurt. We would just eliminate it. So that God's top 10 is for the fulfillment of creation, not the hindering of joy. But none of us can do it. But that is God's general will for us. That's his desire and plan. The great commandment is what Jesus said. Jesus summed up all the law in this. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's God's general will for our lives. Most of the time, we, we kind of overlook that one. What we want, and we, we jump to this next one, is God's specific will. 
And if I could give that kind of a definition, it, the God's specific will is the, the unique thing that he intended for you to contribute to the world and his kingdom coming. There is only one you. Like, uh, it's like fingerprints. Everybody is uniquely designed and made by God. Now, there may be some people similar to you or their gifting overlaps with you, but there's only one you. And God has ordained you to come out of your family of origin, however healthy or unhealthy that was. God has placed you in this time period in 2024 for you to be alive. And I just want you to think about that thought for a minute. Out of all the people throughout the history of the world, God chose you to be in this time and space, which is a mind-blowing thought when you look at the problems in this world and God's like, yeah, uh, you're gonna be part of the solution. I want, I've ordained you to live in this unique time and place. So that's what most of us are after. It's a really noble thing. I think God's hardwired it into us. We wanna know what is the unique thing that God has called me to do. That, that thing where I do it, I feel the pleasure of God. I'm running in that lane. Now, many times we wanna know the specific will without first aligning ourselves to his general will. So here's a stronger way of saying it. I cannot expect to get clarity on the specific thing that God has ordained me to do if I'm ignoring, dishonoring, or disregarding God's general will for my life. And if you wanna figure out how something like works and why it works the way it does, you gotta go back to the creator and the creator will tell you how it's supposed to work. So I was like, I don't know how many of you uh, got a gift at Christmas this year, maybe some sort of electronic gadget and you opened it up and you're like, ah, what is it? Like, I don't really know what this thing's supposed to do, you know? And, and then you read the owner's manual and then you figure it out and you're like, oh, this is the intent of the creation. And the same is true for you. Like, you'll, you'll never know, like, what it is that you were made for and why you're here and the purpose of your life if you don't start with your creator. So I just wanna uh, go back, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. Let me just read these passages. It's, it's sort, of like, um, sort of like the owner's manual. It's kind of the origins of creation. And then from that, I'm gonna make some observations from it. But, but look at verse 26. It says, then God said, let, let, let us, so who is he talking to? Well, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the origins of time, they're all together. It says, hey, hey here, here's what we wanna do. We, let, let's, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. And they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. And then in verse 27, notice all the action words in this passage. You might even underline these in your Bible. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them that both genders reflect the glory in the image of God. Verse 28, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, all the animals that scurry along the ground. Just notice all the action words there, created, blessed, fruitful and multiply, fill, govern and reign. Now here's just an observation. This is a little bit of a sneak peek as to where we're going next weekend, is that God has given us meaningful work to do. Um, work, preceded sin. I always thought that work was the result of sin. But work preceded sin. Uh, it, it, it's not that um, sin created work, it's that, it's that sin made work much more difficult. It, it cursed the work. Uh, we also, there will be, um, in heaven, when, when uh, Jesus returns, there will be work in heaven. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, really. Like, but it's gonna be work without all the pain, all the hardships, that difficult boss, that challenging coworker, like all, all the fallenness of what makes work difficult. We'll talk about that next weekend. Part of God's purpose for us is, is meaningful work. And then it says in verse 29, then, then God said, look, I've given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food and I've given you every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life and that is what happened. Now look at verse 31. Then God looked over all that he had made, including you and me, and he saw that it was very good. I love that verse. It's if God's like stepping back, looking at it, going, man, look what we did. This is amazing. And from that passage, we see several key insights. This is all foundational stuff. This is like a, a framework for us 
I mean, ultimately, I, I want you to discover God's unique calling and purpose for your life. But you gotta start with this framework. And I, I just wanna give you a number of observations. These all come out of the text. None of these are my opinion or idea. These all are just observations from the text. And so if you're jotting down some notes, here they are. Number one, you were made intentionally. God made you on purpose. There are no accidental human beings. You might have been a surprise to your mom and dad. You were not a surprise to God. He ordained your life from the future, which is why we say that, that all life has inherent worth and value. You were made intentionally. Second thing, you were made in God's image. That's just a wild thought to me. Those of you that have biological kids, maybe, maybe have you ever looked at one of your kids and go, oh man, I can see, I can see her mama in her. Man, she's a daddy's girl. Or I can just see the resemblances. I've got four kids and at times it just kind of takes my breath away. I'll just kind of turn and look at them and just like see either their, their mom in them or see bits of me in them and poor kids, pray for them. And, and so I just kind of like look at them. I just like, oh man, they, 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 they've got the image of their biological parents upon them. And in the same way, it says that you were made in the image of your heavenly father. It is imprinted upon us. And that fact alone should change the way we treat, talk, and tweet people. <laughs> that fact right there, should you, here's this wild thought. You will never lock eyes with somebody who's not made in the image of their, heaven, of their heavenly father, regardless of whether they acknowledge him or are honoring him with their life or not. James chapter uh, three, verse eight and nine says this, no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of of God. Everybody's been made in his image. Here's the next thing. Uh, you were made for a specific purpose. God really does have a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, you may not know what it is yet. There's a number of things that can maybe sort of um, sidetrack or even derail us from that, what that plan is. But part of the process of discovering God's plan and purpose for your life is even through the setbacks and the breakthroughs which is actually called growth. And God, doesn't want, God often does not reveal his will and purpose for our life all at once. He reveals it as a part of a process of growth so that your character can handle it when you do step into it. Um, you were made with God's blessing. Uh, while everything you do and say may not have his approval and joy, you though, as a person, have his approval and joy. And many of us are carrying around a sense of shame, guilt, or inadequacy because of maybe some past failure or shortcoming or addiction or maybe uh, through the um, abuse of, of someone else upon our lives, maybe just this sense of inadequacy. Maybe you've got this imposter syndrome. Your self-critic is raging. And yet God, he sees you and he loves you and you have his blessing and he wants to mend and heal that wound. Here's the next thing, you were made to give yourself away. Here's, here's what I do know. Um, part of understanding God's specific will for your life is you gotta quit navel gazing. You gotta quit just looking at yourself, looking at how, how, how am I gonna get ahead here because part of understanding God's will and purpose for your life is to literally give yourself away. This, this is why um, uh, meat and vegetables are good for you and Sour Patch Kids are not because that cow and that plant was a living organism. It gave its life so that you could have life. And part of our fulfillment uh, is um, giving ourselves away and serving other people. And in the process of that, you end up finding why you are here. And then uh, the last thing I'll just say is um, you were made with God's approval. And some of you need to hear that because it's been a long time since you have. And maybe you've forgotten or you no longer feel worthy of his approval. I don't know how many of you are like me. For the longest time, I felt this way. I didn't have the courage to ever say it out loud, but I would just kind of feel to myself like, you know what, I know that God loves me and I know that God forgives me, but I don't really think that he likes me because uh, you know, I just keep failing and I keep making him promises that I can't fulfill. He's gotta be exhausted with me. But yet God's, you, you've got God's approval. He, he, he finds glory in you. He, he, he loves you. And that's a wild thought because there isn't anybody that knows you better than God. Like the Bible says that God knows the number of hairs on your head. God knows every thought that you've thought. That's a scary thought. God knows everything you've done 
secretly, the secrets that you're keeping. He knows all that. And you still have his approval. He loves you. That's not true for most people we're in a relationship with. I don't know if you, can't, if, you're, if you know the person sitting next to you right now, but chances are, if the person sitting next to you knew every single thing about you, they'd probably get up and move a seat over. <laughs> Just guessing. But, but, but God actually knows you better than your spouse, your best friend, and yet he loves you, he wants to be in relationship with you. Those are amazing observations that can literally transform your life. And here's kind of the list behind me. You just look at all that. You, you were made with all that in mind. Now here's the question. If all that's true, why is life so hard? If all that is true, then why do I just, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do next. Why is there so much pain in the, in the, in the world? And the simple but complicated answer to that is because this, this was God's intention, but when we chose to rebel and bring sin into the world, th- this is what happened. It fractured the image of God within all of us. And that right there explains so much. I, I can, when I look at that screen, I can still see the words behind it, but it's certainly distorted. It's not fun to look at. There's that little twitchy light thing, and that's gonna get annoying after a while, by the way. And, you're just gonna kind of look at that and you just kind of look at, at the world right now. You just take a look at yourself and I, I, can, I can look at myself and I can see some, some good and some bad. I can see some noble things in my life. I can see some things that I'm ashamed of. Chances are you can too. We, we can look out at the world in which we live right now. We can see evidences of, uh, of heaven. Man, the, uh, the sunset on a beach at dusk. And we can see evidences of hell. Road rage at high noon. You know, we can see kindness in people and we can see abuse in people. We, we, we just, so much of what God oftentimes gets blamed for whenever we look at everything that's so broken in the world is really just the result of that. It's just, it's the result of sin. We, we are living right now in the, uh, uh, Jesus has come and he has come to create a way for us to be reconciled with God, but his kingdom isn't fully restored. We're in the in-between. So we can see both. We can see the beauty and the pain in the midst of, of all of that. And um, this explains so much of why we toil and why we struggle. Paul actually uh, says it so well in Romans. He says, uh, I don't really understand myself for I wanna do what is right, but I don't do it. Any of you relate to that? <laughs> Paul must've made some New Year's resolutions, I don't know. He goes, instead, I, I, I do what I hate. That sounds irrational. That sounds human. He, he says in verse 21, I, I've discovered this principle. He actually calls it a principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. In other words, uh, if you try to white knuckle morality, you just empower the sin or the urge within you. You, you cannot do it on your own. And he goes, in verse 22, he says this, he goes, I love God's law. That's another word for, for God's word, God, the, the Bible. He says, I love it with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. And this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me, that. I have the sin fallen, broken nature. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And God gave us an answer in the person of Jesus. He'll set you free. Jesus came 2,000 years ago to deal with the fracturing of our identity because he knew that we could never fix that. And so he came to fix it. He came to pay the debt that we could not pay. He came to live the life we couldn't live. He came to die the death that we deserve to die to reconcile us back to God. But then, then here's the beautiful thing, to re-image us back to God's original intention for us. And so we are, here's what salvation is. It's a miracle. It is the re-imaging of that broken nature within all of us. Now, on this side of eternity, it's not yet fully 
fulfilled, but, but here's what happens, is that when you become a Christian, something supernatural happens. The Holy Spirit enters into you, and it begins, you, you begin to get re-imaged into the person, likeness, character of Jesus Christ, and you begin to stand out because now you are residents of his kingdom coming, and God is coming to restore what has been broken. So every time somebody becomes a Christian, that's a little glimpse of what God's gonna do to creation as a whole. And I wanna be a part of it. I wanna be a part of it here, and I wanna be a part of it then. You cannot understand God's specific, unique calling for your life until you get that right as a baseline. So this isn't about like living your best life or being successful. This is about understanding that you step into God's specific calling for you, regardless of what you do for a living, when you begin to get reconciled with God and re-imaged into the person and likeness of Jesus. Some of you may be pushing back on me right now and go, I don't know, Aaron. I mean, it sounds great, but you know, I know lots of non-Christians who seem to be living their best life. I mean, lots of influencers on social media, lots of people super successful, seem like they've got a really happy marriage. They seem to be doing quite well financially. They don't acknowledge God. They're not following God. How do you explain that? And I would just simply say, well, a couple things. Number one, not everything on social media is true. So just remember that. And uh, we oftentimes have a tendency to compare others' outsides with our insides, so anybody can wear a mask. Well, let's just say like, that, that they are like, quite successful, they're, they're living life quite well. It's part of the reason why Jesus said it's very difficult for the wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God, like the camel through the eye and the needle, that kind of a thing, because you just don't really recognize your, your need. And there is a real difference between temporary happiness and eternal joy. There is a difference between momentary success and eternal victory. You know, a Christian doesn't mean you're perfect. A Christian just simply means you've been redeemed by God. You still got junk to work on. That's why we're all hypocrites. We still got stuff to work on. There's still issues and challenges and, and, and trauma in that. And so, <laughs> amen, all right? Preaching, preaching to, to somebody. I, 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 um, I, I've read this quote before, but I love the clarity in it. And actor Jim Carrey said this. He goes, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. And I would just simply say that for those who, they, they, look, they're, out, they're not following Jesus and they seem to be so su successful, they are the recipients of what I might call God's general grace. And everybody across, in the world right now is a recipient of that. Regardless of whether you believe in God or not or you're living a totally different lifestyle, whatever, whatever it may be. It's like, what do you mean by that, Aaron? Well, just as long as you're breathing, as long as you have a roof over your head, as long as you've got a, another meal, you are the recipient of God's general grace. Like, you, you are not a self-sustaining person. Like, you, you, you know, you don't tell your heart to beat, it just beats. You don't tell your body to breathe, it just breathes. That's God's general grace upon your life. And even those who are far from God still have some showers of blessings upon it in the sense of God's general grace. But all of us need God's saving grace. And that's a different thing. That requires an understanding of the deficit of my need. That, that requires an understanding that I need a savior and I am not him. That's an understanding that I need somebody to reconcile me back to my heavenly father. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10 says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. You wanna know what the Bible is about? That one sentence right there pretty much sums it up. We have a tendency to make this thing so complicated, it's not rocket science. God saved you, how? Not by being good, not by working really hard, not by managing your image, which is what all of us have a tendency to fall into. He goes, he saved you by his grace. Well, when? When you believed. Well, believe what? That he is God and I am not that Jesus reconciles me to him, that the Holy Spirit comes into my heart, that I've got to turn from my sin and begin to follow after him, that I've given God my whole heart, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. You don't pay for gifts. You just simply receive them. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's 
masterpiece. He has created us anew, fractured image, made new in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. That's this whole series in a single statement. You are God's masterpiece. Something dramatically went wrong. A rock went through the mirror. Now he wants to make you anew in Christ so that you can figure out the good things he planned for you to do a long, long time ago. Man, you've got to begin with that. And today, that cannot happen in an instant right where you are seated. And you can be reconciled with God. And it's gonna feel weird, because you're like, oh man, like I, I, I'm the same person I was just a second ago. I still got some of those same struggles, those same setbacks I gotta deal with. Yep, um, what happens is, is that you uh, have a right standing with God, and from that standing of certainty and security, then you can begin to grow. And you will spend the rest of your life um, growing into the image and likeness of Jesus. So uh, my, my task as a pastor is both very complicated and very simple. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's simple in the sense there's really only two things I'm really trying to prompt you to do. I'm trying to get those of you who don't see your need for a savior to see it and to receive him and then the rest of you to step into that process of sanctification and growth. And what I mean by that is not that you would grow in head knowledge. Some of you are like 15 Bible studies and you listen to tons of podcasts and all kinds of worship music and your head is full but your heart's still empty. Because it's not about knowledge, it's about transformation. This is why some people that have like seminary degrees are jerks. Because the, the knowledge didn't go from their head to their heart. And some people are all heart but no head. And so it's this idea of like understanding that God wants to change you, he wants to, to grow you. I always find it, it usually happens periodically. I'll get an email or somebody will message me and say, you know, I'm really disappointed in you. And I'm like, thank you, appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> they'll say, you know, I, I just really wasn't expecting this, you know, when I kinda came to the church and I just, uh, thought, you know, everyday language, you just kind of dress, you know, like normal, and, and then, uh, you know, I'd hear you teach, and I just really honestly was disappointed. I just thought you'd be a more progressive pastor than that. And I thought, well, I am. I'm trying to help you progress more and more into the image and likeness of Jesus. That's what I'm trying to help you do. That, that, that's what we want. And the word for that is, is, is sanctification. Now, here's the deal. Man, you get that right in your life, where you have a standing with God, and you're beginning to grow in your relationship with God, now watch how the question of what it is that God specifically wants you to do with your life, it begins to unfold in front of you almost effortlessly. I'll never forget, um, about 25 years ago, as a young man, I was sitting in a half-day workshop with an author by the name of Dallas Willard. Some of you might recognize that name. Uh, he's since passed away. But he was a professor at UCLA, wrote a number of books that deeply marked me, especially my uh, early journey as a Christ follower. And, uh, I remember being in this workshop with him, and this was the uh, t uh, content he was talking about. He was talking about knowing God's will for your life. And I'll never forget something that he said, because when he said it, I about fell out of my chair, and I had to chew on it for a little bit, because I'd never heard anybody say anything like it, and I was trying to figure it out. And he said this. He goes, listen, if your heart is fully surrendered to Jesus Christ, if you have fully given everything you are to him, then God's will for your life is whatever you want. And at first I was like, I didn't really understand what that, what that meant because that sounded like so flippant. But think about the logic of that. If your heart is fully surrendered to God, then you will do what pleases him. And God actually gives you great freedom in that. There have been moments in my life, big massive crossroads decisions, you know, uh, should I propose to Lindsay or not? Should I take this job or not? Should we move to this state or that? And I kind of thought, well, God's got one plan laid out for me, and if I make the wrong decision, then I've kind of ruined the rest of my life. That's kind of what I thought. And I remember even, specifically even contemplating coming here to in this, in this role, and I really wrestled with it. And I remember in the quietness of the morning being like, God, I don't wanna mess this up. What is your will for my life? What do you want me to do? Do you want me to go to Trader's Point? Do you want me to, to stay where I'm at? And I just had this, just this quietness of the Holy Spirit in that moment where he said, Aaron, uh, either way, you're still in my will. If your heart is fully mine, I'll bless either path. Guys, there's a tremendous amount of freedom. If your heart is fully surrendered to him, he'll bless either path that you take. I, I, I wanna um, 
end with this statement right here. Uh, and it's simply this. You were created in the image of God, but you must be discipled into the character of God. And that's what we desire and want for you as a church. Listen, we're not just trying to grow bigger as a church. We're not trying to grow bigger and bigger crowds. Now, unapologetically, we're casting the net wide and deep because we know there's a lot of people that need hope, a lot of people that need Jesus. This world is broken and dark. And so we're gonna try to reach as many people as possible. But that's not why, that's not what motivates us to grow bigger crowds. Uh, we wanna um, meet, help you get introduced to Jesus and then to dig deep roots as a disciple, which means being formed into the character of God so that your feet are steady for unstable ground, whatever may come. And so we're trying to do both of those things at the exact same time. The deep part, much of that is, is upon you. We're, we're trying to create some pathways, but you gotta take them. Like you gotta be fully invested in it. And one of those is a, something called Rooted. I know a number of you have gone through it, but those of you that haven't yet, the next session starts January 16th. We got 150 spots available. I'd love for you to sign up for Rooted. What a way to kick off a brand new year. You can follow the link and jump in on that. It's just a 10 week course with a small group. It's designed to do exactly what it's, how it's called, to root you in the faith. And uh, together as a church family, let's step into whatever it is that God's got for us in 2024. I, I, something tells me it's gonna be a rodeo. Something tells me there's gonna be some challenges and some ups and downs, but as a church, we can have steady feet for whatever may come to glorify our heavenly father and to be representatives of his kingdom coming to this world. Let's pray together. Father, we just wanna consecrate this year in front of you. We know that um, it's probably gonna be a wild one. And uh, yet we know that you are sovereign and in control. And uh, we wanna be a people whose hearts are fully devoted to you. And so God, would you please give us clarity and courage and obedience to, to trust you no matter how tumultuous the waters might get. We know that you've made a way and uh, one day you're gonna restore all things. Scripture tells us that you're actually bottling up every tear that we shed on this side of eternity so that one day you can reconcile each one of those tears. So we choose to trust you. We choose to know that even in the midst of the challenges, you're developing a, a character that is ready for whatever calling you've ordained us to step into. And so we lift up our voices, we raise our eyes to you, we trust you in the midst of these uncertain days because you are worthy of it all. We ask this in Jesus' name and everybody said.